The Apollo space program folded 51 years ago. Nobody has walked on the moon since. Weirdly, a growing number of people don't even believe moon landings actually happened. This belief is growing more and more with each generation. The list of reasons range from the bizarre to the confusing, and many of the moon hoax landing debunkers have been caught doing some fabricating of their own. So on this episode of the Glenn Beck podcast, I'm going to go straight to the source. One of the only remaining men who actually walked on the moon. He served in five of the seven Apollo missions dedicated to landing on the moon. The BBC has called him one of the most historically important voices in America. I want to keep this episode in our vault. Odds are that uh, you might know what his voice sounds like because you've heard it before. He was Capcom during Apollo 11, he'll explain. He's the one who talked to Buzz Aldrin and Armstrong when they landed on the moon. It was to him that they were talking to when they said, Houston, the eagle has landed. He played a huge role in getting the astronauts of Apollo 13 back safely. Only 12 humans have walked on the moon. Today's guest was the 10th. He walked on the moon when he was 36, making him the youngest person to leave footprints on the lunar surface. He's one of the four living men who have done that. He made it I think he made it absolutely fun. He played a big part in the image of an astronaut being cool, intimidatingly smart, yet sparse with his words, his brilliance, tucked into a southern drawl. He saw more in 10 days than most people will see in 10 lifetimes. Please welcome a real-life space cowboy, Brigadier General Charlie Duke. Before we get to Charlie, first, you've heard me talk a lot about the Jace case from Jace Medical. The Jace case holds five of the most important antibiotics for emergency use. I'm happy to announce that they are launching a new product, Jace Daily. It's a prescription supply service that allows you to get up to 12 month backup supply for your prescription medication in case of an emergency. It's going to cover a whole bunch of medications like cholesterol, diabetes, heart health, blood pressure, mental health, and so much more. Your order is reviewed by a certified healthcare professional and delivered right to your front door. Recently spoke to Sean Rowland, who founded Jace Medical. He explained that being prepared medically is much more than just having access to antibiotics, especially when you learn that all of your medications are produced overseas. He said the peace of mind gained by having this kind of long-term supply of your vital medications can't be overstated. For your sake, sake and your family's sake you need to be prepared go to jacemedical.com enter the promo code back at checkout jace j-a-s-e medical.com charlie thank you for being here delighted to be with you again yeah, glenn thank you so i have been struggling with something for uh, a while, I, I think that there could come a time that people are convinced that Americans never went to the moon. Um, everything, our history is being so discredited, our country is being discredited now, and there is a growing number of people that say, we never went to the moon. Mm -hmm. And uh, I fear that in 20, 30, 40 years, China or Russia will be the ones that were known to go the moon and so i i collect an awful lot of stuff as you know some of your stuff is in our collection um and i wanted you to come on and a talk about your experience on the moon because it's mm -hmm. amazing but then i also want to i want to hit you with some of the conspiracy theories um and i'm not looking to i'm looking for a scientist's uh answer Mm -hmm. to some of the things that are said because i think some of them are ridiculous and some of them i don't even understand i don't i don't know yeah so we'll go through those okay first of all sputnik sitting behind you that's one of the prototypes of sputnik back there mm -hmm. and 1957 that went into space how old were you i was at flight school i uh, just started flight training at moultrie the moultrie georgia spencer air base uh, and uh, they, it lifted off uh, 
I think on the 4th of October, which is the day after my birthday, and I turned uh, 57, uh, that would have been, I was 22. Mm-hmm. So 22 years old, the world changed. This is the beginning of the yeah. space race. You being a test pilot, what did that mean to you when Sputnik was? Well, I wasn't a test pilot at the time. I was just beginning flight training. Okay. Uh, and I uh, was uh, at Spence for six months, uh, did well, sent me off to Webb Air Force Base in Big Spring, Texas for advanced, not advanced training, but uh, got my wings there, then back to Moody uh, in, uh, by February, September of 58, I had my wings and uh, by the April of 59, I was ready to go to my first assignment, which was a fighter interceptor squadron in Ramstein, Germany. Mm. So uh, I was uh, in Ramstein from 1959 until 1962. And during that time, uh, 61, uh, Yuri Gagarin launched uh, the uh, Americans. Uh, of course, uh, Alan Shepard followed a couple of weeks later. and. A few weeks later, Kennedy announced the Apollo program, which uh, we all laughed at him. You know, he had 15 minutes in space, and he's going to commit us to the moon in a, uh, eight and a half years. Uh, but the remarkable thing about it, I look back now, was that uh, eight uh, uh, that eight and a half years later, or eight years and two months later, I'm sitting in mission control talking to Neil Armstrong when he lands on the moon. Because you were, what was it called? Cap, Capcom? Capcom. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Capsule and, Communicator, that stands for. Right. And so Neil Armstrong asked you to be Capcom, and yeah. everything went through you, right? Well, uh, I didn't make the decisions. The no, flight, no, no. Di- no, the but flight the director, but conversation. the communications all went through me. Yeah. So you had to do it right. You had to put it in in uh, technical language that's crew understood. And uh, I had done the same job on Apollo 10. Uh, and it was the same group of uh, flight direct, uh, flight controllers and director, Gene Krantz. And mm-hmm. so we just moved over, they did. And uh, I wasn't supposed to be there because they had another crew, but uh, Neil said, Would, uh, I'd like Charlie to do that for us since he'd had that experience. So when they said, uh, Houston, it would be your voice that would answer? That's correct, yeah, during, a, during the descent. Uh, you know, mission control shift work, so uh, there are different shifts. Uh, mm-hmm. So when they landed and we secured the spacecraft, our shift went off and another shift came on. So Bruce McCandless was the flight, uh, was a Capcom when he actually stepped onto the moon. Mm-hmm. Wow. And... Um, there was, I mean, landing it, there was a lot of worry. Didn't did something happen? Yeah, a lot the circuit happened. Was, what happened? <laughs> uh, we were doing a good job until we started the engine on the descent and, until, and the wheels started coming off, if you that expression. We had uh, communication problems to uh, start with. And, uh, and the mission rule was if you lose... If you lost communications for 30 seconds, you were going to abort the mission. So uh, we reoriented it and got some new antennas pointed at the Earth, and it thing came back. And then the computers started overloading. We were getting these uh, 1201, 1202 alarms. Uh, Which is what? Well, it was a mean. The, the Apollo computer had a compute cycle at, let's say, 0.75 milliseconds. And it queued up the jobs, uh, so the guide the spacecraft, direct the spacecraft, control the spacecraft. And then below that was these auxiliary jobs. Well, if it got to the end of the, uh, if it's compute cycle and he hadn't finished that queue, uh, it would give you a warning, I- I'm overloaded, I'm flipping back to the top. Mm-hmm. And so uh, that was what it was. So it wasn't the control of the spacecraft, it was just as we had it doing too much. And one of the reasons was uh, the radar landing uh, radar uh, landing switch was. I mean, the radar rendezvous rendezvous radar was uh, switch was on, and it shouldn't have been on because it, now the computer's trying to find what it's supposed to be looking at. And uh, anyway, uh, we went through that. Uh, we were trained, and Steve Bales and Jack Garman uh, knew what to do. We were go, and we kept having that situation. 
then at 7,000 feet, they pitched over and looked down, and Neil says, uh, we can't land here. So he had to level off and fly across the surface of the moon for several miles till he found a suitable landing spot. Well, that used up all our spare gas. And so now we start down, and we're, now we're minimum fuel. And uh, we got to the call. Yeah, wait, wait, wait. Beyond minimum fuel or minimal fuel we were, for we, takeoff to return back up? Well, the, the the ascent engine fuel is not used on descent. It's just there, uh, and the engine's not used. When I say minimum fuel, we had a minimum amount that we wanted to have. When if we aborted, we we'd still use the descent engine to start us on a positive mm-hmm. tra- trajectory away from the moon. Then we would abort stage and light the ascent engine and. Uh, and so that was what the – and the minimum was like, if I remember, 4%. And when we got to that 4%, we called uh, 60 seconds. And uh, 60 seconds meant he had another – at the present fuel, uh, present engine power, he had 60 seconds uh, before we would call an abort. So we got to 30 seconds. And I said, the Eagle, 30 seconds. And the t- you can imagine the tension in the, in the oh room. Oh, my gosh. And uh, so uh, about 13 seconds later, uh, Neil reports, uh, not Neil, but Buzz says, contact engine stop, and they're on the moon. <laughs> and we just erupted with uh, excitement. And, uh, and so we didn't have to get that abort call. Uh, I'm convinced that Neil had the final say. And if we were 20 feet off the ground and we called an abort, he wouldn't have done say it. Say again, Houston. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. Uh, he was going to land at that point. Yeah. Because because so. they they had kind of an unspoken agreement, didn't they? That yeah. Well, he was in charge, and he could see the. We just knew he was. 20 feet above the moon mm-hmm. uh, and we didn't understand you couldn't see everybody couldn't see this the situation that he sees and buzz sees out the windows and the sisters and they're 20 feet off the ground and they still got five percent fuel left or four percent whatever it is you're not going to abort because of that and uh, he's going to land at that point Did there come a time where they worried if they could get back up to the but that's the capsule, right? Yeah. Get back up to the capsule and go back home? No, that was any. Uh, the ascent, as I said earlier, the ascent engine provided that propulsion. And, okay. and the fuel, it's not used at all during the descent stage, during the descent. So you have full tanks, uh, you have all electrical power, everything ready to go. So if you had to abort uh, from the, once he landed and shut down that engine, if, if there was a leak in a NASA engine tank, for instance, uh, that we would have aborted, aborted immediately and got them back into orbit. And so you were still Capcom when he said Houston the Eagle has landed. That's correct. Yeah. And uh, then you had a switch. You had a shift change. No, we had a. Uh, it was later, about an hour later. We uh, uh, after they landed, uh, we. It was our job to make sure the set of the spacecraft was secure, safe, we could stay. So we had a series of stay, no say decisions. No stay, no stay. And so one was like three or four minutes later and we were stay. Then as we got safer and safer and more secure with the, the status of the vehicle, finally after, I don't know, 30 minutes maybe uh, or uh, a little bit more, we were saying, okay, we're stay for your stay. And uh, so then we changed shifts. So you, did you even know what the surface of the moon really was like at the time? Uh, we'd had uh, surveyor land and uh, several surveyors, and they, they analyzed it, and they could see it was basically very, very fine dust. Can you and des- we knew— Can we- you describe that? Because I hear— the dust from the moon is unlike anything we've seen here it's, on Earth. Yeah, it's like talcum powder, and uh, it's uh, uh, it's very 
uh, very adhesive. It, you can't, if you fall down, you get dusty and you can't get it off your suits. And uh, it's, so your suit, our suits after three days turn from white to gray. Uh, and uh, mostly light gray, I should say. So the dust was very, very fine. And uh, when you got it back in, when you got back inside the spacecraft. Vacuum it, right? Um, didn't you have to vacuum it off? Uh, we didn't have a vacuum for that. Oh. We had a brush, but it didn't do any good. Yeah, I was going to say that yeah. wouldn't work. And uh, so we got back inside and we cleaned up as best we could. And uh, especially the seals where the hose is mm-hmm. And uh, then, but we just decided that it wasn't going to, it Hurting. wasn't going to get, it wasn't going to hurt. And so uh, we, and then uh, we had some loose dust and that we tracked in and I picked it up and it was very, it was not gritty at all. It was very, very fine and it was very dry. And what I think happens was it, it was so dry, it picked up the oils on your skin, skin huh? uh, and uh, that gave it gave a, a, a graphite feel to it, mm. and uh, and you smelled it, it smelled like gunpowder. But it, there's no organic material on the moon, so it's very strange. Mm. At least that was my feeling. It was that smell. So Neil and Buzz were on the moon for two hours. No, they on the were surface? Uh, less than 24. Uh, they were on the surface. Yeah, for, walking around. Yeah, and less I'm not than sure, two. two to four hours, something like that, yeah. And when you went up, you were on the moon on the surface for 20. Uh, we were on the surface for 20, total of 72 hours on the moon. Uh, right. But the, we divided that into three 24-hour periods. And so we had an excursion. The longest was like eight hours. And every day, and then we got back in on the last time and uh, got ready to lift off. Kicked our back- backpacks out the door and trash and didn't want to lift off with that stuff. And, and so uh, we got ready to lift off, and right on schedule, we were, we were off. What is that like? Lift off or what no, is No, walking on the moon. Well, it was an adventure, of course, and uh, you felt right at home. Uh, you recognized the major landing, uh, the major features at your landing site that you'd studied from photographs and uh, simulations. And so we, we had this feeling of belonging, but it was the excitement and the awe and the, and the wonder. Uh, I'm on the moon. You could never get over that point. Nobody's no. ever been here before. What is it like to be on the moon the first time you turned around and saw Earthrise? Well, we didn't see Earth rise. Uh, a day on the moon is twenty is two weeks. Oh my! So, so did you see the Earth uh, from not, the moon? We were in the middle of the moon, and it, which put the Earth right overhead. So in an Apollo suit, you look up and you look at the top of your helmet. So we very rarely saw it. Uh, we we had a telescope, not a telescope, but a periscope on our antenna, and you could look through that and point it at the Earth and get it centered up. And there you could see it, but it was uh, it, it, occasionally I'd bend back like this and hold on to the car and look up, and there it was. It was beautiful. Half Earth, uh, we were a half moon, and uh, blue and white. It's just uh, there it is. And the rest of the sky was just black. You can't. Why don't you see stars? Because the sun, the sun, basically sun, same as daylight here. You don't see stars that they're there. But because of the sunlight, you don't see the stars. But at night, uh, you see the stars come out because there's no reflection from the moon, the sun. Well, same on the moon. Uh, so you, the sun's always shining on you and uh, when you're there. And, uh, and so you look out at the horizon, and there's this very distinct horizon, and you just look up, and it's just black, uh, except for the Earth, which is... In our case, you couldn't see it really goodly. Uh, wow. So it was, uh, it, 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 I, we didn't want to come home. We were having so much fun. Oh, I bet. Uh, mm-hmm. I hear you try to do a, a set a record for a long jump, and that didn't go so well. Well, it was a uh, you know, high jump. Actually. High jump. High yeah, jump, that didn't right. go very well. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? Oh, well, the, the, I went down here with, I, with all my equipment on. I weighed 363 pounds up on the moon, 60 pounds. Wow. And so uh, the backpack, uh, the life support system weighed as much as I did. So 
I got a 150 pound pack on my back and you got to on the moon, you have to walk bending over to keep your center of gravity right. Mm. So when I jumped, I straightened up and go up. And when I did that, took my center of gravity backwards and I went over mm. backwards. And that was scary. That was probably the only time I had fear in the whole time. And uh, but fear is not a bad cool. emotion if you don't no. panic. Yeah. And uh, so I, I had this thought, roll right. So I rolled to the right, and, and uh, as I was going down, it broke my fall on my right hand and my right leg and bounced onto my back, and my heart was pounding, Glenn, I'll tell you. But I'm, I checked the pressure, and it was well. You could hear the pumps running, and the, and the suit was good. So uh, John Young walked over and ran over and looked down and said, that wasn't very smart, Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> I said, you're right, John, help me up. Well, and, I was the first to try it. Yeah, I mean, somebody and, had to try it. So uh, we, uh, and he'd been jumping too. So uh, he probably set the record. Uh, let's say we set the record. And when I got up and uh, I was behind the rover and I got up and looked at and the TV camera on the car was pointed right at me and uh Mission Control was very, very upset with our moonwalk. I mean, my moon jump. So that was the end of the Moon Olympics. <laughs> wow. Might be a good time to pause for a uh, sponsor. And that sponsor is Preborn. Since Roe versus Wade, over 64 million babies have been aborted in the United States. Nearly one in five pregnancies end up this way, even now. And with the abortion pill accounting for over half of the abortions performed, babies' lives are still at great uh, risk. So we'd like you to join the Ministry of Preborn. We are trying to save 70,000 babies' lives again this year. We got a good start. We have a lot more to do by the end of the year. We're at 28,000 babies' lives saved. That's incredible. And the way we do it, Preborn introduces expecting moms to their babies by providing free ultrasounds. And it works. And they don't just stop there. For up to two years, they also provide assistance to the mothers who choose life. Please play a part in this. One ultrasound is $28. Any gift will help, however. $140 gift sponsors five ultrasounds. $5,000 will sponsor Preborn's entire network for a day. And if you have the means, $15,000 will place an ultrasound machine in a needy pregnancy clinic. Just hit pound 250, pound 250, say the keyword baby. All gifts are tax deductible. Preborn.com. Because it wasn't just you, your property, really, your hope and despair. If if you do something stupid. Yeah. You kill yourself, really. I learned a very valuable lesson. Never do anything on space that you haven't practiced on Earth. Yeah. <laughs> How, when you practice, you practice underwater, et cetera, et cetera. How uh, like Space is station, it? And, uh, and we had one or two little exercises we did underwater. But uh, and on the moon, you got gravity. So we did a lot of zero, uh, we did a lot of one six get gravity training in the airplane where we do parabolas. Mm. And we, they had a car, so we practiced getting in and out of the car and we practiced doing this and that and the other and then drilling our, uh, doing the experiments in one six gravity. So we didn't do much w- underwater stuff. Mm. Um, were you a God fearing man when you went out? I was a Christian. Uh, I claimed to be a Christian, but it was a it was a mental ascent, and not a heart ascent. Uh, and so, uh, uh, I don't know where I would have stood uh, at that point. I know I wasn't walking as a Christian. I was going to church. Our fa- we faithful churchgoers, and uh, since we got married, and uh, but uh, it was uh, later on after the moon flight. Uh, I was 36 when I landed on the moon. When Apollo was over, I was 37, and the thought occurred to me, I'm 37 years old, what am I gonna do now with the rest of my life? And I had no peace, and my marriage was falling apart. And uh, so things were pretty bad until 1975 when my wife became a believer after a Faith Alive weekend at our church. And, uh, 
And so uh, she changed. I watched her change, uh, sadness to joy in two months, and uh, it was real. Two years later, I made that same decision, and that began a healing in our family, a healing in our, uh, uh, in our marriage, and uh, saved our marriage, Jesus mm-hmm. did. And uh, so we've been walking with the Lord, and I know now it's a hard thing. I, so that, after, in 78, uh, when I made that decision, uh, and Jesus came from my mind to my heart, I experienced peace. And it was just incredible. And I knew that I knew that I knew that I'd made the right decision. So uh, Mm -hmm. we've been walking with the Lord uh, ever since. And we have a Christian ministry called Duke Ministry for Christ that uh, uh, helps with the finances, but it doesn't, uh, it's it's not a big organization. Right, right. So we, uh, we, told the Lord, he said, if you keep giving us invitations, we'll keep going. Hmm. But we don't go advertise yeah. for, for invitations. So, Charlie, my dad was, hmm, it might have been his 70th birthday. And he told me when I was young that he was born in 1926, I think, 23 or 26. And he said, Glenn, we never... We never even considered going to the moon. That just wasn't even real. He said, uh, you know, that might have been later movie stuff, but nobody ever really thought about going to the moon. And uh, one of his biggest days was just watching the moon landings. And um, he never got over that. And on his birthday... um, it happened to coincide with a meeting that I was having with uh, Buzz Aldrin. Mm. And so my dad and I uh, went out to lunch with Buzz. And afterwards, he said, I said, how was that, Dad? He said, that was one of the saddest things I've ever experienced. Um and I, I don't know Buzz, and I have so much respect for him, but um, he said it's as if he never could find something bigger than the moon. Mm-hmm. And I don't know how you would do that. I mean, yeah. it, you go as a young man, you do something that, what, 12 people have done? 12 people have gone on the moon. How, do, how did you get... How, how did you get past I'm on the moon? Yeah. I was on the moon. Mm-hmm. Well, it was like I said, uh, it was uh, no peace. Uh, I just kept working at NASA for the so next. So was that what you were feeling with the no peace? Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, what am I going to do now? You know, yeah. how do you top a, a walk on the moon? You don't. Yeah. It's like every party. Somebody says, you know, hey, just got back from France. I, you win every time yeah. I walked on the moon. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, uh, so it was, uh, you know, and, and working on space station, uh, not space station, but space shuttle wasn't the same. It was NASA was, and Apollo was so dynamic. You, you, the, the, the decisions were made Quickly. instantly. You know, you know, if we had to change this spacecraft, uh, this system, you, you could convince uh, the manager, uh, spacecraft manager or the Apollo manager that, that this was necessary, bang, he did it, and uh, it was done. That's how but he got shuttle, to the moon in 10 years, or yeah. eight. Mm-hmm. But the sh- space shuttle was, uh, well, we'll have another meeting next week mm-hmm. uh, or next month, and uh, we argued on the coefficient of drag, and we argued over this and that and the other. It just was boring to me. So the dynamics of Apollo just faded away in uh, those days in shuttle. So when I left in 75, the 70, early 76, that was the state of shuttle. And it was five more years before they got the shuttle flying. And uh, I look back now and say, well, I wish I'd have stuck it out for another five years and uh, flown the early shuttles, but mm-hmm. that was passed. And so, and, uh, so even, even working on shuttle wasn't giving me uh, that, peace that I needed and uh, 
So basically, I took my eyes off the moon and put them on money, saying, well, maybe money's the, mm. the answer. Because we weren't, you know, astronauts don't make a lot of money. Well, you make, if you're a colonel in the Air Force, you make what every other colonel in the Air right. Force makes or whatever. So uh, anyway, I tried business and I was very successful, but I didn't have any peace until 78 when I, uh, Jesus came. Mm -hmm. And now uh, I see I can do whatever I do and, uh, and, 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 and I bring, hopefully bring glory to the Lord and whatever I do. You know, back to your dad, my dad was born in 1907, mm. three years, four years after the Wright brothers. And he watched his son walk on the moon. Wow. What an amazing time from 40 feet with the Wright brothers to landing on the moon in, uh, in 70, uh, what would it have been, uh, less than 60 years. Yeah. My father said that. He said, he said, son, look what's happened in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. He said, we went from no running water, no electricity, seeing the first car, the first motion picture, all the way to where we are. This yeah. was about 2005, all yeah. the way to where we are today. Yeah. He said, never before has this ever happened like this. Yeah. And uh, he said, but we haven't grown as people. We haven't grown philosophically. We're still asking the same questions generation after generation and still coming up with the same answers. He said, where has, where has the growth been, mm -hmm. that kind of dynamic growth yeah. in our spirituality? You know, I see pockets of it uh, yeah. around the world as a revival here and there, uh, but uh, it seems to me in our society today, uh, uh, Christianity is uh, is basically too rule oriented, and why? How can you possibly tell me what to do? And mm. So people are rejecting it. Fortunately, our families, uh, kids, grandkids are pretty still pretty solid, but they're facing a. Our grandkids are facing a uh, onslaught of. Uh, oh yeah. Negativity. I can't imagine being a kid now. Yeah. Just raising my kids. I, my youngest is now 17, mm -hmm. and it's a different world. Yeah. It yeah. is a different world. Oh, my my uh, grandkids now, our youngest is uh, Libby's 14, and uh, I've got a great granddaughter that's a year old. And uh, so we're doing a lot of praying for mm -hmm. them and uh, that, uh, they get it, that they get it right. If you will, I and mean, so I'm, I'm optimistic. Uh, but uh, sometimes you see what's all going on in the schools, and what they're teaching in the schools is is totally crazy. Uh, Especially with this new thing about that it's not about merit. I don't know if I'm going to the moon. I want to know that everyone behind me earned that position because they were the best mind we could possibly find. Yeah. And we're not doing that now, and that 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 doesn't put a man on the moon. No, but uh, it. Uh, I see a lot of uh, uh, in the astronaut corps and the people working on the program have a lot of dedication. Mm -hmm. Though it, uh, uh, that doesn't bother me. It's just the uh, the uh, the things I see at uh, and our kids that are facing in high school. You know. Uh, that gender stuff and uh, yeah. and all of this uh, stuff that's uh, biblically unsound, and so it uh, it's crazy to me to me. To, and so you, we got to pray for them. It's amazing to me how quickly the world changes. Sometimes Russia recently stopped a massive grain deal, pretty much guaranteeing that the world's food supply will be diminished, and that's just one issue our world is facing right now. There are all kinds of things, especially when it comes to food, and you do not want to get caught unprepared for the difficulties that lie ahead. That means you really need a proper supply of emergency food on hand before disaster strikes. You're going to breathe easier knowing that you can feed your family in a crisis, and you don't have to worry about the fragile nature of our food supply and our, and our chain. 
I recommend going to Patriot Supply, my Patriot Supply. I like good food. This is good food that will keep you alive. They have really good food at 25% discount right now on each three-month emergency food kit that you need. Breakfast, lunch, dinner, drinks, snacks, all of it. Providing over 2,000 calories a day. Get at least one kit per person in your family. Grab a 25% discount now. It's MyPatriotSupply.com. That's MyPatriotSupply.com. Something I've struggled with a lot is Operation Paperclip. And you knew Werner von Braun. Mm -hmm. I think if it wasn't for Walt Disney and Werner von Braun, we may not have been able to go to the moon. It was man in space that Walt Disney did with Werner von Braun that Mm -hmm. first lit the imagination of, yeah, we can put a man in space. Um, And he had a huge part of it. But as I read about Werner von Braun, and I I don't know what to believe. I don't know what to believe. Um, There are some that say he absolutely had to have known what was going on in his own camp when he was over in Germany. You knew him personally. Mm -hmm. So let me separate you first from what you personally know about him um, and just say, because we brought hundreds of scientists over here, medical professionals. Did we do the right thing after World War I by saying their knowledge um, beats the character or what they were doing for that knowledge? Well, I, uh, you mean World War II. I'm sorry, yeah, World yeah, War II, yeah, yeah. sorry. Uh, uh, those, uh, as I as I can see, they had a job. Uh, they were knowledgeable. All of the scientists that worked on the V two and mm-hmm. the, in, in the German rocket program, and uh, and I think they were said you're going to work on this program whether you like it or not, mm-hmm. and that was just the way Germany these people were commanded. Mm-hmm. And so I think uh, when the war was winding down and uh, von Braun was convinced he didn't want to go to Russia because he saw what What they were like. They were like. So he knew that the U.S. was a a better choice. And they came to U.S. and uh, the Army put them to work in the uh, uh, Missile Command. And and I think their allegiance to the U.S. was always – good and uh they changed over and they they were they were very uh the ones i met of his upper echelon uh, kurt debus and uh, uh struhol and the others at, at marshall uh that worked for von braun were outstanding citizens and mm. they loved america and they loved the space program and they wanted to commit com- commit to uh the once NASA was formed to the peaceful exploration of space. Prior to that, they were working for the Army Missile yeah. Command, but and providing us a uh, expertise because it was being that those missiles were being developed anyway, and right. so why not take advantage of right. the knowledge they had? What What did you so, do with? How did you know him? I mean, well, uh, Stu Russo, the uh, in the astronaut office when we first got there, everybody was assigned sort of an additional duty. You 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 monitor the spacecraft development. You monitor the lunar module development. You monitor the Saturns. So Stu Russo and I got put on a. Uh, that was our job, uh, and was to go and monitor the development of the Saturn rocket and then report back to the astronaut office. Uh, And so monthly, we would fly to uh, Huntsville, Alabama at the Marshall Space Facts Center and attend Werner von Braun's monthly management meetings. Wow. And uh, we just sit there, and uh, we didn't have any input into it, but he welcomed us in, and uh, we became friends. And uh, and I was very... uh, impressed with his uh, management ability and his his insight into knowledge uh, of the of the problems and uh, they did a tremendous job with the saturn five we never had a failure in a saturn uh 
not a catastrophic failure. We maybe lost an engine. I think only one engine uh, was lost in in, uh, in the Saturn V. And is that because of Werner von Braun and his team? Yeah, and his team. And uh, so they uh, they developed this massive uh, rocket uh, uh, that was uh, until the space launch system SLS is about to launch. Uh, they it's more powerful than than the uh, Saturn, but uh, I mean, we it it was a tremendous machine, and and Vern Braun was behind it, uh, and his team, and they did a fantastic job not only to uh, to to monitor the design and the uh, changes, but also to launch it. Uh, Kurt Debus at Kennedy Space Center was one of Vern Braun's uh, original team, and and they they were responsible for the launches and uh, did a fantastic job. Why did we stop going to the moon besides disinterest? I mean, it's uh, such it, a... It wasn't disinterest. I think it was a, a... Disinterest from the people, I think. We got used to people going to the moon, it seems. Yeah, well, <laughs> that, that's true. I mean, you know, Neil, every, every second was covered yeah. by Walter Cronkite in the news. And right. when we went, uh, well, ho-hum, uh, you know, it was fifth landing on the moon and... Uh, Nobody's interested anymore. They. they I remember would, your launch. Yeah, we I would do hit the, we, the launch. Would hit the papers. The landing would hit the papers. But well, they were out again this time. It, it all. It, mm -hmm. it, it. They were successful, but it was never on the TV. And uh, so my family uh, was able to go to Mission Control and into the VIP viewing room and sit behind the, wow. the controllers and and watch us on the moon we had a, a funny thing happen that i found out later that we were on the moon and i have a twin brother an identical twin brother and he's uh, uh, uh we're up there on the moon and you could see us bouncing around on the moon well the flight surgeon invited my brother was a doctor and invited him to come into mission control <laughs> so the door opens and in he walks and they said it was a showstopper. Everybody looked and they looked at me. <laughs> yeah, who is this? I thought he was up there. No, maybe it's that's videotape. Not, that's coming from Hollywood. Yeah, maybe yeah, that might be the origin of uh, one of the conspiracy right. theories. Yeah. <laughs> um, when you hear people talk about conspiracy theories about that we never went, mm -hmm. how do you feel? The, the, it, uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm perplexed because the evidence is overwhelming. If they would investigate the evidence that we have that we landed on the moon, not once but t six times, uh, you can't uh, deny all the evidence. You, we have photographs from Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter that's taken pictures. You can see the descent stage. You can see the car. You can see the experiments package at all I on our landing site, and every Apollo landing site is is documented, and uh, and for four hundred thousand of people to keep it a secret for pretty fifty years is pretty, it's remarkable pretty remarkable. If we faked it, yeah. And I told one of the NBC something. Uh, I said, if we faked it, why did we fake it nine times? <laughs> you know, if you go fake something, do it once and shut up, right? Uh, but we went nine times to the moon and landed six successfully. And so uh, with the, the equipment we left, the, the science that's come back, the rocks are totally different than the earth rocks. And uh, all of the evidence is, is we landed on the moon. There's no question. And Somebody said, and I don't even understand that, there's a radiation belt in between earth and the moon. Mm -hmm. And they say you can't get through that. That's the Van Allen belt. It's high intensity radiation, but you're going through it at 25,000 miles an hour. So it's, it's, it's seconds you're through. It's like an x-ray. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it was, uh, uh, that, that's, that was no problem in Apollo. Mm -hmm. you're, you're, um, you're below, in Earth orbit, you're below that. But when you leave for the moon you accelerate at 25,000 miles an hour and then you're through those belts within minutes were we concerned about that belt the first no. time we went through mm -mm. Mm -mm. because I we're going I don't remember any concern uh what they were concerned about was the radiation on the moon and uh 
And if we had a solar flare, how would we protect the crew? And uh, uh, then uh, the the big un mis not misunderstanding, but the biggest uh, unknown was, you know, if the moon is three billion years old, it's been collecting dust for three billion years, and will you sink into the dust? <laughs> and a lot of the scientists thought that. So we landed surveyor to, to make sure we weren't going to sink out of sight when we landed. And uh, so there was surveyor sitting right on the top of the moon. And I mean, surface. And, well, I mean, it might be dust, but it's going to be compacted or something. Right. Yeah. And it's tr true. I, I shoveled. I had a shovel and I dug a trench and uh, near where we landed. And uh, as the flight plan called for and i got down to i could only get three feet uh but as i shoveled it was still dust but it had a great bearing strength it was it was actually pulverized rock and when you analyze look at it on a microscope it's jagged but it when you interlocks yeah it interlocks and so you step on it we never made uh footprints deeper than maybe uh an inch or two inches at the most and uh, so I've heard two things on that. I've heard that the footprints, you don't make footprints on the moon. You don't make footprints on the moon. I don't know who these people are that come up with this or what they're using, but you can make footprints on the moon. And then I've also heard that the footprints aren't deep enough. Well, uh, they, they would, it, it depended on your weight, I guess. <laughs> if you weighed 500 pounds, you know, you're going to make a deeper footprint than I do at uh, 300 pounds right. in my suit. Uh, and uh, but you you always left your footprints. You never and, and we drove the car, uh, Glenn, and we never worried about getting lost on the moon because the tracks were always there. You just did a right. U turn and follow your tracks back, and uh, so uh, you can see that you can see the tracks in the photographs from Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, and um, and so it's. Uh, evidence is overwhelming what do you didn't we leave um like a measuring mirror or something on the moon uh so it can... was a a uh uh yeah I, now you got me a mental blank on it was a a, a a reflector right and you could beam a laser on and get a reflection from this object and we did we didn't leave one on our flight, but several before did, and so. Can you still hit it with the? Yeah, they can still hit it with a with the with the lasers. That would seem to be kind of important. Yeah, the, uh, I think it was fourteen two before yours that uh, left an altar on the moon with the lunar Bible on it. Is that correct? No, it was supposed to be on thirteen. Right. Uh, yeah, and uh, it was microfilmed, uh, and when the first. 13 brought it back, uh, they uh, put it on 14, and they left it there. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And and some of it was uh, uh, one or two copies were brought back, and it's been mm -hmm. uh, distributed around the world. Yeah. And, uh, we have but one We in had the um, <clears throat> a Jim Irwin on a, a Apollo uh, 15. <clears throat> After he got back, uh, he uh, became an evangelist. Uh, and had High Flight Foundation, hmm. Colorado Springs, and uh, he quoted scripture on the moon. And uh, Buzz Aldrin had communion, Christian communion on the moon. And uh, uh, and then Apollo 8 quoted from Genesis mm -hmm. uh, on that first TV mm -hmm. back of the earth. Which, so there was some spiritual input but I, I didn't never had any i didn't feel like i had a time uh to uh philosophy or to until uh, after yeah it was till after yeah and uh so it was uh i was busy uh, the whole time with focused on the uh, on the procedures and the you got to get this job right. done you know yeah <clears throat> Remember back in the day when you could do all the normal things you wanted to do in a day without feeling like you were made entirely out of broken glass? Remember when you didn't have to decide whether or not it was worth it to do something? Because it wasn't going to hurt you to do it. Living with pain is not a joke, and it's the kind of thing that just wrecks your life. It just 
will consume so much of your day. Fortunately, I've discovered Relief Factor. If you've been dealing with pain in your life and you feel like you've tried everything, try Relief Factor. Give it a try. If it works for you, you get your life back. Three-week quick start, $19.95. It's a trial pack. They're open with you and say, just try it. Take it as directed for three weeks. After three weeks, 70% of the people go on to order more, which means 30% of the chance that you it doesn't work. But that 70% chance of getting your life back, it's worth it. 800 for relief 800 the number four relief relieffactor.com one of the things that people say I'm just going through the conspiracies because i want you to leave record uh moon landing hoax conspiracy theories um who shot the footage he's walking out on the moon one giant leap for mankind Look, he had a tv where, camera where it was in the as he walked down as he walked down the lamb, uh, he pulled a handle that deployed what was called a mesa, the modular equipment assembly, modular equipment storage assembly, storage area, whatever it was, and in that was a camera. And so when that came down, they flipped it on, and the camera was pointed right at the at the landing. And so as he came down the ladder. This camera was taking his picture. It's a TV camera. It's grainy, but it was it was in that assembly. Right. And then once we got off, uh, they they took the camera and put it on a, um, a little tripod, if I remember. But on a, on our flights, when we had the car, uh, we had a camera <clears throat> uh, in the same area. And we deployed the car, and then I took the camera and stuck it on the car. Mm -hmm. So uh, as we drove, uh, it, it, we we took pictures ourselves because the TV, the antenna was going like this as you bounced across the moon, right. and it couldn't point it at the Earth. So when we stopped, we pointed the antenna at the Earth, turned on the TV, and then they controlled it from mission control. Mm. As a guy sat there, he could— he could change the focus. He could change the uh, everything. He could tilt and move it around, and we just turned it on, and they they took all the pictures. Yeah. Um, th people say the flag is a dead giveaway because it's waving, and there's no there's no yeah. way a flag is waving. Well, the flag was vacuum packed, Glenn, for six months, and uh, and when I unfolded it. I couldn't get the wrinkles out, and they didn't give me an iron. So, <laughs> so I pulled on the flag and got most of the wrinkles out and stuck it up. It looks like it's waving, but it's not. If you and I took a picture once we got the flag up, I took a picture, and then seventy-two hours later, I took another picture in the same wrinkles, the same waviness, and it's held out by a curtain rod or. Yeah, aluminum rod, mm -hmm. and so it's all of these things that they say like this are just easily explained, but nobody wants to believe it. They they got this thing, you know, and now the Earth's flat, you know, and all that stuff. And, I can't know. believe yeah. that me either. People are saying that. How what do you shape feel about, is it? How do you feel about the um, uh, the mission to Mars? Uh, not the government, but now all these private companies. I'm I'm all for it. Uh, I think uh, that was one of the greatest things that uh, is uh, a, a giant leap, if you will, for uh, for the space program was uh, uh, SpaceX's and Blue Origins and mm -hmm. all uh, getting involved. And, um, you know, NASA never made a thing. We always put a proposal out. We need a lunar module. We want it to do this and that and the other. And so we hired the companies that built it for us, Grumman and North American Rockwell and Rocketdyne and all of the people that were manufacturers, and we gave them contracts. And so we ended up with a spacecraft. The, the, what happened with SpaceX and Blue Origin, they came to NASA and said, this is what we got, you wanna buy it? Mm -hmm. And NASA says, yeah, we'll, tell you, we'll buy that and we'll buy this. And so they're and they're really good at, at making changes and low overhead and and NASA said uh, basically is giving them three of three or four of them uh, big contracts to uh, 
So SpaceX been the most successful. Blue Origins uh, coming along, and uh, uh, and then uh, another one with uh, Boeing uh, to help. So NASA f- gave them the seed money. Right. Uh, I mean, they put their money in and developed what they thought was going to be the future. And sure enough. Uh, I I heard somebody say um, just a couple of weeks ago there was a launch of uh, Tesla, and uh, and it blew up, and the immediate response was really we went to space we could do this in the '60s but we can't get it right with today's technology and my first thought was it's not easy or everyone would do it yeah why does it seem that we have we're not using it seems like we're not using the technology that, like the Saturn V rocket that we know works and is dependable. What's the difference? Uh, 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 new rockets and new designs uh, are, uh, uh, can be difficult. Uh, and so this big one that blew up at uh, Boca Chiga uh, in Texas uh, was... Uh, 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 just a failure, but they have had tremendous success. Mm-hmm. Uh, S- SpaceX has launched astronauts uh, in their SpaceX mm-hmm. capsules, and they've even recovered the booster. Right. That's incredible, isn't it? And so the technology is a lot farther along than we did. Yeah. I mean, if we threw everything away uh, as we used it in Apollo, uh, you know, the first stage, and uh, it came back in, and and some of it survived. Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, Bezos found five of the Saturn V S1 engines uh, 12,000 feet down under. Wow. And they've been, they've been restored and, and debarnacleized or whatever you want to call it uh, by uh, uh, Space and Rocket. No, not Space and Rocket Center. The uh, Cosmosphere out in Hutchison, Kansas. Mm. They're tremendous uh, restorers of space artifacts. You believe in... UFOs, alien life? Uh, no, I don't believe in alien life. Uh, uh, I believe uh, that the uh, there are, uh, God showed me a specific answer to a, two prayers, that they're demonic, and that they're uh, uh, d- mm. demonic beings that make an appearance uh, and appear to be real, and they are real. Uh, I'm angel, uh, Satan, Bible says angel, can, uh, Satan can appear as an angel mm-hmm. of light. Mm-hmm. So uh, they can appear, and so nothing human can make a 90-degree turn at 3,000 miles an hour mm-hmm. and survive. And so they have these, and I think the purpose is to draw you away from the, the, the real uh, God and say, look at us. And this is where you ought to be because mm. we are superhuman and and mm. we can do it. So uh, uh, that's my feel. People laugh at me generally, but I'm not going to be. I don't care. Because, <laughs> I love you. you know, <laughs> I love you. Yeah, you know, God um, is, is. He's answered prayers. Me, my prayers specifically. And uh, so I said, uh, and I get laughed at when I people say, "Well, I, that's what God told me." So I'm going to be. Uh, say that they're, they're, they're demonic beings, and there's yeah. not any uh, extraterrestrial. I mean, uh, super, no, not superhuman, but uh, uh, other civilizations out there that are farther away from us. It's it's a it's a distraction from from God. Last question. I don't understand. I've been trying to get a spacesuit, an American spacesuit. I want to keep it in the museum. I could buy a Russian spacesuit. I could buy a Chinese space. I could buy a dozen of those. I cannot buy an American spacesuit at for any price mm. from any time period. Why? I don't know. I can't answer that question. Uh, my uh, my flight suit ended up in the South Carolina State Museum. Yeah, uh, your flight suit. I mean. Your no, no, my helmet, my f- the, the, the suit full, I wore on the moon. Yeah, it's in private hands. No, no, it was in the South Carolina State Museum. It was on loan from NASA, mm. but then NASA took them all back, and they're now 
Why? Because they were deteriorating and they were historic artifacts. And so we're going to put them in a nitrogen environment and uh, we're going to keep them uh, uh, forever. And But nobody gets to see them. That, to me, is just crazy. The things that were deteriorating is not the exterior. It was just the uh, inner, inner pieces, the, the rubber and all of that stuff. So anyway, they took it back and now they're all at the Smithsonian. But I think you can. Uh, I've seen uh, 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 suits that are what I would call um, training suits mm-hmm. uh, from Apollo, mm-hmm. and uh, and I don't. I'm just looking for things that have actually been to space. Well, I, that might. Yeah, that's difficult. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I mean, you can. Uh, I've got things, and uh, we were able to keep. Um, which after a big fight, uh, we were able to keep some artifacts that we brought back from the moon, but there's nothing like a spacesuit uh, that we— What did you bring back from the moon? Well, we had uh, some of the stuff that we used on the lunar surface, the um, uh, the shovels, the uh, rakes, uh, uh, those kind of things. Wow. And then you could—once the spacecraft was used up in the lunar module, you could take the netting around, off of it and uh, some mm-hmm. of the— checklists and stuff like that right. was, that we'd used and we just brought it back with us mm-hmm. not only did we use it to help debrief uh the the missions but uh, then uh we were able to keep that but it turned out uh a congress finally there was a big uh, debate well it's government property but Congress finally passed a law that says uh, all the Apollo artifacts are, uh, that were brought back or the, the, that are in the hand, private hands, the, uh, the astronauts uh, have the authority to keep them. So, and, then, and when you go, yeah, they'll probably take them back. <laughs> Charlie, thank you. Very much. Uh, thank you very much, Glenn. I've been enjoyed being with you. Likewise. Re- respect you a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Likewise. Thank you.